Ben Franklin's World is a production of the Omohundro Institute, and this episode is sponsored by The Great Courses Plus. Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, a podcast about early American history with Liz Covart. The study of history is key to understanding who we are and how we can affect a better future. Ben Franklin's World will introduce you to historical people and events that have impacted and shaped our present day world. And now, here's your host, Liz Covart. Happy New Year, and welcome to episode 167 of Ben Franklin's World, the podcast dedicated to helping you learn more about how the people and events of our early American past have shaped the present day world we live in. Can you believe it's already 2018? At least for me, 2017 went by in a blur. And I have to believe it's because so many great things happened for this podcast in 2017. Like, we're now produced by the Omohundro Institute, which is great, because they have such a wonderful team of scholars and staff at the College of William & Mary who now help me produce this show and keep it going. We also had the Doing History to the Revolution series, which in so many ways was epic because it allowed us to explore both the history and histories of the American Revolution so that we could better understand what we know about it. And Ben Franklin's World won the Academy of Podcasters Best History Podcast Award of 2017, which is really quite an honor because that organization awards its podcast Oscars based on content and craft. So it's just fantastic because they're saying, of all the history podcasts out there, Ben Franklin's World is the best. You know, 2017 was such a big year for Ben Franklin's world, I almost have no idea where 2018 is going to take us. And I do have to say almost, because I do know it is going to take us on many more interesting explorations of early American history, and that I'm going to keep working hard to produce this show and help you explore as many of your requested topics as possible. And I guess with that, we should get back at it and explore one of your requested topics. New Orleans. The Crescent City began as a French colony in 1717. By 1840, it was the third largest city in the United States. How did that happen? How did New Orleans transform from a sleepy French outpost into a large and important American city with a thriving, bustling port? This is the topic for today's exploration with Eberhard Lowe Faber, an assistant professor of history at Loyola University, New Orleans, and the author of Building the Land of Dreams, New Orleans and the Transformation of Early America. As we explore the early history of New Orleans, Lowe reveals details about the founding of New Orleans by the French in 1717, how and why New Orleans and Louisiana changed hands four times between 1762 and 1803, and how the people and city of New Orleans became American and a part of the United States. But first, I realize this is short notice if you're not on the Ben Franklin's World email list or not in our listener community on Facebook. We're having a meetup in Washington, D.C. this coming Saturday, January 6th at 5 p.m. We're going to meet at the Open City Diner in Woodley Park. Now, I've posted details about this event in the show notes. And if you'd like to learn more about our meetups faster and have the opportunity to pose questions to our guest historians, you should join the Ben Franklin's World email list and its listener community on Facebook. You can do both by texting BFWorld to 33444 or by visiting BenFranklin'sWorld.com. Okay. Are you ready to explore the history of early New Orleans? Allow me to introduce you to our guest historian. With tidings and wisdom to share about our early American past, here is this week's special guest. Our guest is an assistant professor of history and music industry studies at Loyola University, New Orleans. His historical research interests include the colonial and 19th century history of New Orleans and the Gulf Coast. And prior to becoming a history professor, Our guest spent 12 years leading the New York City-based rock band, God Street Wine. Of course, today we'll be discussing details from his first book, Building the Land of Dreams, New Orleans, and the Transformation of Early America. Welcome to Ben Franklin's world, Eberhard Lowe Faber. Thanks, Liz. It's great to be here. Now, in Building the Land of Dreams, Lowe sets out to tell the story of how New Orleans was reimagined and transformed between the colonial and early republic periods, and how it became more American over time by becoming more New Orleanian. Lo, I think we should start at the beginning. Would you tell us about the founding of New Orleans in 1717? Sure, yeah. Well, New Orleans was founded on paper before it was founded in person. It was essentially founded by a clerk in Paris who wrote down, you know, the Company of the Indies had decided to build a city. So it was, you know, very top-down, very kind of absolutist France. It was a latecomer 
in the world of colonial projects. Spain had been in Central and South America for two centuries. The British colonies in Virginia and Massachusetts had been around for about a century, so that's not an insignificant amount of time. New Orleans and the French Gulf Coast colony was late coming, and it was part of this big financial scheme created by the Duke of Orleans, who was the regent who was ruling France at the time, and a Scotsman named John Law who put together this big investment scheme, later called the Mississippi Bubble, because it built and it drew millions in investment. And then it burst, and there was a crash, and people lost all their money. But meanwhile, there was a colony to sort of go on. So it really differed from a city like Boston, for example, which started very spontaneously. New Orleans had a very well-planned rectilinear grid from day one. But then, you know, when the Mississippi bubble crashed, it was really the locals who were left to pick up the pieces and try to build something once the actual French investors lost interest. If we look at the geography of New Orleans, we'll find it sitting near the southern mouth of the Mississippi River, where it empties out into the Gulf Coast. So, Lo, what was it about the Gulf Coast that interested the French? I mean, why did they decide to build a city at this exact geographic location? You know, really nothing, Liz. <laughs> it just happened to be there. Later on, especially for Americans, New Orleans became a really key strategic point. But for the French in 1717, they just wanted another colony in North America. And it didn't have any tremendous natural resources. There were no precious metals. It just happened to be the place that was available at the time. You mentioned that the structure of New Orleans' society was absolutist like France. Would you tell us what that meant? What was the structure of the city's first government? Well, they had an appointed governor who was, you know, usually a military person. But there was also quite a lot of local autonomy from the very beginning. And this, of course, speaks to the difficulty of ruling places at a distance in the 18th century. I think not just the French, but all the European colonial empires had to acknowledge a great deal of local authority. So locals in New Orleans had something called the Superior Council which really held the political power in the colony. Now, New Orleans was French for 45 years. Then, in 1762, the colony became Spanish. Lo, how did that happen? Would you tell us how New Orleans became Spanish? Well, first of all, the French had really lost interest after 1729. So there are really two French periods. One is the Company of the Indies period, where there's a great deal of sort of optimism and enthusiasm. But they can't get people to come over and settle. So they resort to some of the typical alternatives, which is finding convicts and vagrants and prostitutes and kind of forcing them to come over, going outside of France to get people from Germany and Switzerland, and of course, going to Africa and bringing over enslaved Africans who made up about two thirds of the population of the region by 1730. Then in 1729, there's a big Indian war, and the Company of the Indies loses interest and collapses, and it becomes a royal colony, which basically means complete neglect. So it kind of stagnated until the 1760s, and then in 1762, as France is losing the Seven Years' War, the one that historians call the Great War for Empire, you know, Britain is winning the Great War for Empire, and France is on the verge of getting booted out of North America completely, France decides to hand over Louisiana to Spain because the monarchs of France and Spain were cousins and they were both Catholic. And it was better to have Louisiana in friendly Spanish Catholic hands than have it potentially go to the hated British, which seemed like it might happen, which is what did happen, of course, to Canada, France's other big North American colony. So 1762, Louisiana now belongs to Spain, but in the nature of these things, it takes them a few years to bother to send over a governor. So it's not till 1765 that they actually send over a governor to take possession of Louisiana. And once the Spanish finally did take possession of the colony in 1765, what did the transition from French rule to Spanish rule mean for the people who lived in New Orleans and Louisiana? Did this transition mean changes to their culture or politics or methods of conducting business? Well, it was pretty tumultuous at first. The Spanish governor, a man named Ulloa, arrived in 1765, but he had no troops and he had no money and he really had no power. 
So, you know, the local Creole planters who ran the Superior Council pretty much decided that they didn't want any part of him. And he also announced that there would be a new sort of mercantilist system in which they could only now trade with Spain. And they didn't like that very much. So essentially, they said no to all of that. And they actually deported Iloa, put him on a ship, sent him back to Spain. And they thought they had won, but no. And then Spain sends another governor named O'Reilly, a Spaniard of Irish descent, who comes down with a lot of troops and actually crushes the rebellion and executes the ringleaders by firing squad in a street which was later named Frenchman Street in honor of these so-called martyrs, but that came much later. So there's this little rebellion in 1768, but then after that, Spain really governed Louisiana with a very loose hand. They, for example, allowed French to continue on as the official language, and the Spanish governors and other officials became quite friendly with the Creole elite planters and continued to allow quite a large degree of local autonomy on the ground in Louisiana. Louisiana was not a very important colony to the Spanish. It didn't have any great economic or military significance. So they thought of it as a buffer, a buffer between their real colonies down in Central America and the British in North America. Louisiana was there to make sure that those two things didn't come into contact with each other. Now, was it because Spain viewed Louisiana purely as a buffer and governed it so loosely, the reasons why the Treaty of San Lorenzo or Pinckney's Treaty came up in 1795? Perhaps you could even tell us about this treaty and why it was so important and such a big deal. Sure. I think Pinckney's Treaty was a huge deal. So it's 1795, and there's now this new nation, the United States you know, gained its independence from Britain in 1783 and become a sort of genuine nation with a constitution in 1788. And now this new nation wants to sort of clarify its borders in the Southwest. So that's one big thing that Pinckney's Treaty did was to sort of draw the line between the United States possessions and the Spanish Empire across what are now the states of Mississippi and Alabama. And the other thing that Pinckney's Treaty did that was really big for our story was to allow Americans to bring goods down the Mississippi on flat boats and store them in New Orleans for export and use New Orleans as an entrepot for export. And the reason that was so huge was because of the Appalachian Mountains, which you have to remember, of course, this was an era in which the most efficient form of transportation was river transportation. There are no highways, there are no trucks, so you can only transport large quantities of goods on a river, and before the invention of steamboats, you can only transport them in one direction downstream. So if you're west of the Appalachians, as many Americans were starting to be, as they moved into what are now the states of Kentucky and Tennessee and Ohio, even western Pennsylvania, if you're in those regions, the only way to get your agricultural products like hemp and pork and wheat The only way to get them to market is by sending them down a river like the Ohio over to the Mississippi, all the way down the Mississippi on a flatboat and out to the Atlantic world through New Orleans. So Pinckney's Treaty allowed them to do that. And it might not sound like much, but it was a huge loophole in what was ordinarily a very closed Spanish economic system. So it helped the development of the Trans-Appalachian West, and it also fostered all kinds of ties between American Western settlers and the world of New Orleans and lower Louisiana. And those economic ties really started to accelerate after 1795. It also seems like Pinckney's treaty highlights the fact that while the Spanish may not have thought of New Orleans as a valuable colony, the United States really seems to have viewed it as a valuable entrepot and port city. Yeah, that's true. In the 1790s, people like, well, most famously Thomas Jefferson, are starting to realize how important New Orleans is because it guards the Mississippi, which is the key to the whole continent west of the Appalachians. And, you know, Jefferson, of course, was not a militarist. Famously, he was the opposite. On the other hand, there are Americans who do think in terms of military force, and they think, you know, we need to go out and conquer this territory. But for Jefferson and people who thought like him, 
it wasn't so much a case of armed conquest. They thought there was a sense of inevitability as Americans moved west that these regions would sort of gradually become dominated by Americans who would bring these kind of Anglo cultural values and culture of political democracy into the West and sort of gradually demographically overwhelm the Spanish and French population. Now, what did it mean for the United States and for all the Americans who were using the Mississippi River and the Port of New Orleans as a trading center and transit hub? What did it mean for them when in 1800, Louisiana reverted back to French control? Well, at first, it didn't mean anything because the treaty was secret. So here's France uh, sort of rising again, rising under Napoleon Bonaparte, who is eventually going to be emperor. And Napoleon's developing his own new colonial scheme. And the new scheme is really centered on the colony of Saint-Domingue, which later, of course, became Haiti. And Saint-Domingue is, by this point, the most lucrative sugar-producing colony in the world. And Saint-Domingue, of course, has had a revolution. They've had the emancipation of all slaves under the Jacobins in the 1790s. Napoleon's plan involves re-enslaving the working population of Saint-Domingue, going back to producing lots and lots of sugar there, where Louisiana comes in is that Louisiana will now be the sort of wheat-producing breadbasket to feed Saint-Domingue, because in Saint-Domingue, we want every inch of the island to be dedicated to lucrative sugar cultivation. So with this scheme in mind, Napoleon goes about sort of browbeating the Spanish. He's sort of turning Spain into his satellite state and made this deal with the Spanish where they give back Louisiana secretly to France in exchange for a teensy little property in Tuscany, which became the sort of personal villa of the Spanish king. And then over the next few years, 1801, 1802, the details of the secret treaty sort of leak out, and rumors start to spread that Louisiana is going back to French control. But the French don't actually you know, take possession. They don't send a governor or a military force to take control of the colony. And then, in the meantime, of course, Napoleon's attempt to reconquer Saint-Domingue and re-enslave its population fails, and his army in Saint-Domingue is crushed. So the whole scheme isn't going to work out. So that's when he decides to sell Louisiana to the United States in 1803. That was a really important purchase by the United States. We should actually really talk about it. So would you tell us more about the Louisiana Purchase of 1803? Yeah, so we're just picking up from where I left off. Napoleon's sort of colonization scheme in which Louisiana was going to be the breadbasket for sugar production in Saint-Domingue had collapsed. And at the same time, Americans were, you know, as I said with Jefferson, very interested in New Orleans as a strategic place that would allow westward expansion across the American continent. And at this point, Jefferson was, you know, embroiled as he always was in political struggles against the Federalist Party. And the Federalist Party, as far as the Louisiana issue, was very aggressive, and they really favored force. And the Federalists essentially said, we need to raise a big army and just take possession of Louisiana and make it our colony. And so Jefferson was susceptible to the charge of being too soft, quote unquote, on the Louisiana question. He was being politically attacked. For that. So Jefferson has a different idea that maybe I can acquire Louisiana peacefully. So he sends a special envoy, James Monroe, over to France. And James Monroe joins the French ambassador to France, Robert Livingston. And together they negotiate with Napoleon's ministers a deal to buy not only New Orleans, which is really what they wanted. What they actually wanted was New Orleans and a little bit of the Gulf Coast, which now includes Mobile and Biloxi called West Florida at the time. So that's what they really wanted. But the French said, no, we're selling the whole thing or nothing. And they said, well, okay. So $15 million financed mostly by Swiss banks, very little money down. It was a great deal. It was a fantastic deal. And they got much more than they had originally wanted or even knew what to do with. But it was clear that New Orleans was the key to the whole thing. And I think this is sometimes easy to forget because eventually, you know, there was the Lewis and Clark expedition to the great northern part of the Louisiana Purchase, and that has attracted so much attention and so much fascination that we think of that sometimes more than what was the real point of the Purchase, which was New Orleans as the key to unlocking the Mississippi. 
So just to recap a bit here, in less than a century, New Orleans and Louisiana changed hands four different times between three nations. Yeah. And I wonder, how did the people of New Orleans react to the news that in 1803, they were no longer French, but Americans living under the United States? Well, that's a fascinating question. And it's fascinating to me because it relates to the subject of the rise of national identities and patriotism and an attachment to a particular nation or ethnic tribe superimposed on a nation. And I think that, you know, nationalism in its modern sense was something that was really developing in Europe around the time of the French Revolution and because of the French Revolution. So the French, and in my book that you see this through the eyes of a man named Pierre Lossat, who is the prefect that Napoleon sends to eventually take possession of Louisiana. So Lossat is from France, and he comes to New Orleans, and he sees everything in terms of national identities and attachments. You know, are they really French, is his question about the Creoles. Are they still attached to Spain? Are they perhaps interested in being part of the United States? He hates the United States. He calls Americans Anglo-Americans, and he's disgusted with American democracy. And it never occurs to Lafayette what I think is actually the truth, which is that the Creole planners of New Orleans did not care that much about attachment to any foreign power, whether it be France or Spain or the United States. They were a local community. They were rather uh, provincial and fairly insular, and they cared about their own wealth and prosperity and their prestige within their social world. And so it just wasn't a big issue to them for any sort of patriotic sentimental reasons, whether they were going to be ruled by France or Spain or the United States. In their eyes, all of these distant rulers were simply distant rulers to be manipulated, sometimes to curry favor with them and try to get special privileges. But the Louisianians who are particularly proud of their Frenchness, to me, were the exception more than the rule. You know, as a cultural historian, I'm really curious about the transition New Orleans made from being a French colony to an American city, especially since in Building the Land of Dreams, Lowe describes how New Orleans went from being this small Gulf Coast outpost to being a world-class city all during the 19th century. And right after we take a moment to talk about our sponsor for this episode, The Great Courses Plus, we're going to dive into this topic. We just discussed the Louisiana Purchase, which nearly doubled the size of the United States. And this territorial expansion had great implications for the Americans who went west, the Native Americans who were already living on those western lands, and for the enslaved, as the institution of slavery expanded west too. If you'd like to explore more about this expansion, you should check out The Great Courses Plus and its course, Experiencing America, a Smithsonian Tour Through American History. The Great Courses Plus partnered with the Smithsonian to make this course, and you can take it for free during the free trial The Great Courses Plus would like to give you when you visit thegreatcoursesplus.com slash bfworld. Now, in Experiencing America, Professor Richard Curran will lead you on a visual exploration of United States history using the Smithsonian's one-of-a-kind collection of American artifacts. And one of your stops on this tour is a 30-minute long video called The Growth and Spread of Slavery, in which Professor Kern will show you the history of slavery and its expansion in the Americas through objects like Eli Whitney's cotton gin. When you visit thegreatcoursesplus.com slash bfworld, you'll find that The Great Courses Plus has dozens of other courses about history and over 8,500 other lectures available across a wide range of topics for you to explore. Topics like science, math, psychology, personal development, and it even has how-to courses on subjects like photography, cooking, and learning new languages. All of these fascinating lectures are presented by award-winning historians and experts in easy-to-watch 30-minute-long videos that you can stream, download, and watch all on your own schedule and on all your favorite mobile devices. So visit thegreatcoursesplus.com slash bfworld to extend your exploration of history and to delve into new topics that fascinate you. To claim your free trial of The Great Courses Plus, visit thegreatcoursesplus.com slash bfworld. Okay, before we dive into specifics about New Orleans' transition from a city with French and Spanish traditions to an American city, we should explore what the city looked like by 1803. Lo, what were the culture and demographics of New Orleans like in 1803, and what was the primary driver of its economy? First of all, its population, according to our best estimates, somewhere between 8,000 and 11,000. 
And it's hard to be sure because there's a large transient population and people are coming and going a lot from various places. But it was pretty small. And as you said, it grew really dramatically during the first few decades of the American period for a variety of reasons. But by the 1840s, it's the third largest city in North America after New York and Philadelphia. New York and Philadelphia were one and two. And Boston, which was the oldest city, had fallen to number four on the list by the 1840s. So going back to 1803, New Orleans was really in transition, I would say. For most of the Spanish period, it had been mainly a military outpost with, you know, a few farms and plantations. Now, by 1803, two really big things have happened that were going to transform the city. And those two big things are cotton and sugar. And cotton cultivation, because of the cotton gin developed in the late 1790s, and the fact that it's now possible to get the seeds out of short staple cotton. Short staple cotton is a crop that can grow in a wide variety of places. It's a very tolerant crop. So it starts to be planted all across the South. And New Orleans has the good fortune of really becoming the central entrepot for distributing cotton grown all across the South to the rest of the world, and in particular to Britain, where, of course, cotton is central to the Industrial Revolution at the exact same time. So that's one big thing, cotton. And the other big thing is sugar. And sugar happened in Louisiana because of the revolution in Saint-Domingue, which pretty much ended sugar cultivation in that colony in 1795-96. So New Orleanians started to think about whether it might be possible to produce sugar in lower Louisiana, which is a colder climate than Saint-Domingue. And they actually had to develop techniques to make it possible, but they did succeed. Eventually, the first sugar cultivated in Louisiana was at Audubon Park and used to be a plantation owned by a man named Etienne Boré. So sugar cultivation starts in Louisiana in 1797. So you've got cotton and sugar taking off right at the same time. And of course, both of those things highly dependent on the labor of enslaved Africans, which is probably something we should also talk about. So the United States must have been really excited about this. They were getting a rough place, but a place with great geographic location and one that seems like it had a lot of economic promise. Still, I wonder, did Americans ever question whether New Orleans' mostly French-speaking Catholic population could really ever make the transition into the mostly English-speaking, largely Protestant population of the United States? I mean, did they ever wonder whether the people of New Orleans would be a good fit for the United States? Yes. When the Americans succeeded in buying Louisiana, they were well aware of its you know, strategic importance, and that had been talked about for a while. But the cotton and sugar were really so new that they weren't thinking too much about that. And you know, maybe surprising to us now, and we know so much about so much of the globe, but their information on Louisiana was really quite limited. And their awareness that there had been this economic transformation, it was so new that they weren't really saying, oh, now there's all this cotton and sugar and this town is really, really going to develop. Of course, that became clear over the next few decades, but it wasn't really part of the motivation in 1803. Now, whether Americans questioned whether Louisianians could become American, well, very much so. They did. And both sides were very, very aware of the cultural differences and the political differences between the culture of the sort of Atlantic seaboard United States and the culture of French Louisiana. And you see this just in all kinds of ways. I'll quote a letter from Albert Gallatin, who was Jefferson's Secretary of the Treasury and former member of Congress and extremely important player in Jeffersonian politics in the federal government. And Gallatin, I think, spoke a very typical point of view when he said of the French Creole population of Louisiana, he said, let them have slaves and continue to speak French and they'll be fine. They also said that they were mainly illiterate. So, you know, in Gallatin's very disparaging view, they're sort of a bunch of illiterate bumpkins who are very, you know, attached to African slavery, which Gallatin didn't like being from Pennsylvania. And, you know, they just wanted to be able to keep speaking French. And the literacy point was not far off. And actually, their attachment to African slavery was pretty accurate as well. So, There just aren't schools in colonial Louisiana. If you wanted your child to be educated, you know, if you were well off enough, you'd send them back to France for school. 
there is an Ursuline convent that also teaches a few students at this time, but most of the white population of Louisiana in the colonial period is completely unschooled. And there is no public sphere whatsoever. There's no print. There's really no newspapers until the late 1790s when there's one. It's actually against the law in colonial Louisiana to post printed material in public unless it has the actual signature of the governor on it. So very, very different from the kind of culture and political society that's evolving in places like Boston and New York and Philadelphia, where you already have this kind of very boisterous public sphere and political world and print culture. And as you know, all kinds of very adversarial political arguments are going on all the time. None of that is happening in colonial Louisiana. So Americans look at this and they see a people in Louisiana who they say are sort of, well, they're born and bred to despotism. And this is all they know. And they're docile and they simply obey authority. And these are the qualities that they see in Louisianians. And so they question whether these Louisiana colonials are ready for self-government, for republicanism, whether they're ready now or whether they'll ever be ready. You know, maybe these qualities aren't the result of circumstances. Maybe these people are just essentially somehow incapable of self-rule. So that's the debate, really, whether it'll happen or whether it'll never happen. But nobody thinks that Louisiana is ready for self-rule right away. So how did the people of Louisiana and New Orleans make the transition into the United States, both culturally and in terms of governance? Well, in terms of governance, the system of territorial rule was imposed which was very controversial because the United States had emerged from colonial rule itself. So, you know, many Americans questioned whether the United States ought to have something that was essentially a colony. On the other hand, there were many, for example, the Federalist politician from Massachusetts, Timothy Pickering, who argued very strongly that Louisiana should, in fact, be a colony. It should be a territorial possession. So anyway, we have this compromise of territorial rule and the concept of territorial rule had been sort of developed in the 1780s with these various ordinances, most famously the Northwest Ordinance of 1787. And it says that, in essence, that a region can be a territory for a certain amount of time, and then when it meets certain population benchmarks, be eligible to join the Union as a state. So it's kind of this halfway house between being a pure colony and being an organic part of the Union, you're sort of put on this path of tutelage where you can be a territory for a while and eventually be incorporated as a state. And that is what happened with Louisiana. From 1803 to 1812, it's the territory of Orleans. And everything north of the present-day northern boundary of the state of Louisiana was a different territory, the Louisiana Territory. But the present-day state of Louisiana was at Orleans Territory. And then in 1812, they did pass the threshold for statehood. And they voted for statehood, and Congress voted to admit them as a state. So that's the political side. The cultural side, of course, is a lot more complicated. I think that Louisiana stayed culturally French for much longer in some ways. They certainly retained the French language as the dominant language well up into the Jacksonian period. And New Orleans itself remained a stronghold of. French speaking, whereas certain parts of the rest of the state became dominated more by English speaking Anglo settlers. So, as far as the language, New Orleans stayed pretty French for quite a long time. And, for example, religion, Protestant churches started to open up little by little early in the American period. But, you know, even today, New Orleans is predominantly Catholic. So, Protestantism never became the majority mode of religion as it was in much of the rest of the United States. You know, most of our conversation thus far has centered on Western cultures, French, Spanish, American. Yet, as you mentioned earlier, Lo, there were a lot of slaves in New Orleans. Would you tell us about New Orleans's relationship with and use of slavery and about whether the practice of slavery was different in New Orleans than it was elsewhere in the new United States? Of course. Well, first of all, what you just said is a huge and long-running debate among historians. It relates to something called the Tannenbaum thesis, which was developed by a historian named Frank Tannenbaum all the way back in the 1940s. 
he particularly focused on the case of Brazil, actually. But, you know, the thesis as it became later more broadly applied is that slavery in Spanish and Portuguese and French in Latin America was kind of milder and more benign than the allegedly much harsher and crueler system of slavery that prevailed in British and what became Anglo-American regions. And as far as its application to Louisiana, you know, many historians have argued that the system of slavery in Louisiana was, again, you know, milder and less oppressive than the Anglo-American system. And when Americans came down after 1803, they instituted what has been called a new American racial order and a harsher system of slavery. And I tend to push back against the thesis in general, because I think that slavery was quite harsh and oppressive from the very beginning in both French and Spanish Louisiana. And I think that New Orleans is, you know, a place that has a unique culture, of course, and it has all sorts of unique things about it. But I tend to stress the commonalities with other slave societies more than the exceptions. But one big thing is that manumission was easier and a lot more common. And so this is one place where you do have to acknowledge the Tannenbaum thesis. In particular, in most Spanish colonies, there's a system called coartación, where slaves could essentially purchase their own freedom, purchase themselves on a sort of installment system, paying for it, you know, with a series of payments. And so there was no comparable system of self-purchase in the British colonies and in the United States. And the system of coartación was rarely written into law. It was always more a matter of custom. And that custom was not something that Creole Louisiana planters liked. It was always something they actually hated and resented. And as soon as the Americans took over, it was really the Louisiana planters who took it upon themselves to end the system of coartación. So manumission became much rarer. So, you know, after about 1810, if you're a slave in the New Orleans area, it does become a lot harder to eventually find your way to freedom. And I don't want to exaggerate the number of slaves who managed to buy their freedom through coartación was always, you know, a fairly small percentage. And that, as I said, ended during the American period. And of course, what changed during the American period is the development of cotton and sugar production and a much greater demand for slave labor on plantations. And this coincides, of course, with the banning of the Atlantic slave trade. So Britain and the United States both banned the Atlantic slave trade about the same time. And Louisiana planters are clamoring for more slaves. So where do they get them? They get them from the northern tobacco colonies, such as Virginia and Maryland where for a variety of reasons, there's an excess slave population. And so this big domestic slave trade starts up around 1810 and then very, very dramatically after the War of 1812. And starting in the 18-teens, the domestic slave trade, both over land, across Mississippi and Alabama, down towards Louisiana, and by ship coming from Fulston to New Orleans. So slavery itself in the region starts to dramatically accelerate after the War of 1812. Okay, we've talked a bit about culture. We've talked a bit about people and governance. Let's turn now to what this transition meant for the city's economy. What happened economically to New Orleans when it became a part of the United States? I mean, how did New Orleans go from being a city of 8,000 to 11,000 people in 1803 to a booming city of over 40,000 people by 1840? You know, in addition to cotton and sugar, we had a free market. So under both the French and the Spanish, New Orleans had always been subject to a very restricted mercantilist system in which they could only trade with the home ruling country. And they certainly subverted this system a lot, and there was a lot of smuggling, and the mercantilist system always existed kind of more in the letter of the law than in practice. But nonetheless, when American rule came in and all restrictions were lifted. Obviously, if you're a New Orleans merchant, that's a great thing. Now, we have ships coming from all over the world, and we have ships leaving New Orleans to go all over the world. And I already mentioned the link to Britain and Liverpool and the Industrial Revolution 
So that's huge. There's also immigration, lots of immigration to New Orleans, especially from three places, from France. So there are actually a lot of French-speaking arrivals in New Orleans after New Orleans is no longer French. There's also a lot of Irish immigration, and there's a lot of people from Germany. So the real sort of working class Irish and Germans start to come in in the 18 teens and 20s. And so that's, you know, first big wave of European immigration. Of course, later in the 19th century, there will be a lot of Italians and so on. And the lifting of these mercantilist restrictions, which is a big, big boon to the commercial class. And just give a tip of the hat to another scholar, Scott Marler's book is so great on the economic development of New Orleans in the 19th century and also how it then, you know, the second half of the story is how it sort of collapses following the Civil War and later in the 19th century. Now, as we've discussed, after the United States purchased Louisiana and New Orleans from France in 1803, many Americans wondered whether its multi-ethnic polyglot people could ever be American like those who lived along the eastern seaboard or even those who lived in the Ohio and Tennessee River Valleys. Lo, before we move into the time warp, would you tell us about the Battle of New Orleans in January 1815 and what that battle revealed about Americans' fears about the incorporation of New Orleans and its people into the United States? The Battle of New Orleans kind of forms the closing chapter of my book, and I think it really forms the closing chapter of a period in which this region changed hands a lot, and it was kind of up in the air who the region would belong to. I think even in the first few years of American rule, it wasn't clear that the United States would be able to hold on to this region. It might go back to French rule, or it might go back to being Spanish, or it might even become British. But after 1815, it's pretty clear it's going to be part of the United States. And that's because of Andrew Jackson and this great military victory, really a slaughter over the British in January of 1815 which, you know, many people never tire of pointing out was a battle that was actually fought after the peace treaty had been signed that ended the war. So because of the slowness of communications in the early 19th century, the participants in the battle did not realize that the war was in fact no longer on. But nonetheless, I think the battle still had huge ramifications for American history and for global history, really. I often point out that you know, it's easy for Americans to forget that this was so exceptional because it's a moment in 1815 when Britain is winning, winning big across the globe. They're winning in Europe over Napoleon. They're winning in India and laying the groundwork for a huge empire in Asia. And here in New Orleans, this one spot where they suffer a defeat. And in England, they just kind of brush it off. It gets maybe, you know, two lines in the London Times. But for Americans, it becomes this huge kind of validating, affirming victory. You know, we finally proved ourselves with a great military victory over the dreaded British. And also because of the nature of Jackson's army. Jackson's army was a real sort of patchwork quilt of different groups of people. You had, you know, Western sort of volunteer militias from Kentucky and Tennessee. You had French-speaking Louisiana Creoles. You had some Native Americans. You had African slaves who were, you know, building fortifications. So, you know, it might not seem like we really want to celebrate the contributions of enslaved people to the battle. But from the perspective of early 19th century American nationalism, that kind of made sense that there was this polyglot army that defeated the British, who were this kind of professional war machine. And in my book, I say, you know, if you look at this a little bit closer, this legend of Jackson's army doesn't really hold up. That, in fact, at the time, there was a huge amount of worry about whether Louisianians were loyal, whether they were going to even fight on the side of the United States, what exactly was going to happen. And certainly in Jackson's mind, He felt he had to rely completely on Anglo soldiers from Kentucky and Tennessee, that he thought the Louisianians were not to be trusted. So there was actually a great deal of mutual suspicion, and Jackson imposed martial law, and he even suspended the operations of the state legislature by force because he thought there were untrustworthy elements among local Creole politicians. 
So then afterwards, of this great victory, this sort of legend of inter-ethnic cooperation springs up. But before that happened, really quite the opposite. Now it's time for the time warp. This is a fun segment of the show where we ask you a hypothetical history question about what might have happened if something had occurred differently or if someone had acted differently. The time warp. Historians can't predict the future, but they can speculate about what might have been. In your opinion, what might have happened if France had not given Louisiana to Spain in 1762? How would the history of Louisiana, New Orleans, and their relationship with the United States be different? I think that, unfortunately, the best answer I can give is also perhaps the least exciting, which is to say that I don't think that there would have been that much difference. And the reason I say that is twofold. One is that, as I said earlier, the Spanish rulers of Louisiana were careful to rule with a pretty light touch, and they allowed New Orleanians to have quite a large degree of local autonomy, continue speaking French, and they really refrained from making big, big changes. And the other reason I do feel that eventually Louisiana was going to be part of the United States one way or another. And it's with due caution that I say that. But I think that it was probably beyond the power of any European empire to maintain a firm control on a colony like Louisiana in the face of a very sort of energetic, westward expanding American nation. And if, you know, the contingent circumstances of 1803 hadn't happened, Of course, Louisiana might have stayed French for quite a bit longer, but the economic ties, the personal ties, the social and cultural changes would have happened, you know, regardless. And so I think that one way or another, if not in 1803, then maybe a couple decades down the road, this area would have wound up as part of the United States. And so in that sense, it didn't matter that much whether France or Spain was in control What really did matter was the local population and the local power that they had, their vision for the future, which was always very much based on plantation agriculture and African slavery. So that vision, of course, did prevail right into the antebellum period under American rule. So I hope that's not too much of a letdown. Lo, you're a scholar who works in both history and music industry studies. So what are you researching and writing about now? Well, yeah, I'm pretty far afield from Louisiana history right now. I'm actually trying to combine my historical training with my other career, which is my music career. And I'm writing about the development of the music industry in the United States from back when Thomas Edison invents the phonograph in 1877 in the early recording industry and the rise of Tin Pan Alley and American popular music. So pretty different. Our conversation was really far-ranging. I mean, we actually touched on a little bit of a lot of different subjects. If we still have questions about the early history of New Orleans and Louisiana, how can we contact you? Well, you can go to my website, lowfavor.com. My contact information is up there. They can look me up on Loyola's website, also where I teach Loyola New Orleans. Eberhard Faber, thank you for taking us through the early history of New Orleans. It's a pleasure, Liz. Thank you. The French established New Orleans in 1717 because they could. They placed it at the southern mouth of the Mississippi River because the area was available. And after its initial interest in the city and the greater colony of Louisiana, they neglected it. They really only took note of New Orleans and Louisiana again in 1762, when fear of having to cede yet more territory to Great Britain at the end of the Seven Years' War prompted them to give the colony to the king's cousin and fellow Catholic, the King of Spain. And like the French, the Spanish viewed New Orleans as unimportant. They viewed it as a buffer between their more important colonies in Central and South America and British claims in North America. In fact, it wasn't until 1795 that people other than those who lived in New Orleans and Louisiana started to view the city as important. The new United States wanted a relationship with New Orleans. Its position at the southern end of the Mississippi River, where it connects with the Gulf of Mexico, was geographically important to its people. As the American population pushed west beyond the Appalachian Mountains, American agricultural producers needed a way to get their products to market in a speedy, timely fashion. And with few roads and mountains to cross, 
the Mississippi River offered a promising solution. This is why the United States negotiated with Spain for permission to ship goods down the Mississippi River to New Orleans and from New Orleans out to other Atlantic ports. And the fact that Spain, which typically didn't let other nations interact and trade with its imperial holdings, the fact that Spain negotiated and granted the United States permission to use the Mississippi River in New Orleans, that was a big deal. Therefore, the United States became really nervous when it heard rumors that Napoleon had secretly reacquired New Orleans for France. The city and its riparian position were really important to the American people. So Federalists started to talk about how they could acquire the city by force, while President Thomas Jefferson worked to find a diplomatic solution. The solution he was looking for came in 1803, when France offered to sell New Orleans to the United States, as long as the United States also took and paid for the rest of its territory in North America. The United States agreed to this, and the territory it purchased, the Louisiana Territory, nearly doubled the size of the new nation. As Lowe reminds us, we tend to remember the Louisiana Purchase as being about expanding the size of the United States. But when you really look at the deal, it was about protecting American access to the Mississippi River and to the port of New Orleans. In fact, Lowe also reminds us that it's through the early history of New Orleans that we can see how the United States expanded territorially, economically, and culturally. It offers us an opportunity to explore just how the United States and the American people went about incorporating new places and areas with different cultural traditions into their new nation. It's a place where we can see the United States experiencing growing pains as it built and governed a new nation. You can find more information about Lowe, his book, Building the Land of Dreams, plus notes for everything we talked about today on the show notes page, benfranklinsworld.com slash 167. Don't forget, we're meeting up this Saturday, January 6 at 5 p.m. at the Open City Diner in Woodley Park, Washington, D.C. I hope to see you there because I'd really love to meet you and because our meetups are always a lot of fun. Today's sponsor, The Great Courses Plus, can help you learn everything about anything, and they want to give you a free trial to prove it to you. Visit thegreatcoursesplus.com slash bfworld. Today's episode also benefited from the production assistance I received from Holly White, a historian at the Omohundro Institute. Thank you, Holly. Finally, Are there other places in the United States where you think we can see how the early United States expanded economically and culturally? Let me know what other case studies we should be exploring. Send your ideas to liz at benfranklinsworld.com, tweet me at Liz Covart, or post a comment in our listener community on Facebook. Ben Franklin's World is an Omohundro Institute production. And remember, never leave till tomorrow that which you can do today.